Hi, I am Sébastien Roux, third year PhD student at EPFL. The work presented here is a joint work from Helmadi El Mamdi, Rachid Gerawi, Arsani Girgis, Le Engeng Hoang, and myself. Before digging into details, I'd like to give a very quick overview of where this project lies. It is arguably true that machine learning techniques have become ubiquitous today. Even Sergey Brin said at Davos 2017 that Google Brain probably touches every one of Google's main products. And these techniques can carry out critical tasks. For instance, health diagnosis or hiring decisions can already be augmented by machine learning, if not almost entirely delegated to it in the near future. To try and balance the risks with the benefits, machine learning techniques must be made robust, Byzantine resilient in the parlance of the distributed computing community. The literature currently considers two flavors of robustness for machine learning, if you omit privacy preservation. Robustness to evasion attacks when using the model and robustness to poisoning attacks when training the model. In this talk, we focus on the poisoning attacks. Their study, in the context of stochastic gradient descent based training, was initiated by my group four years ago. Since then, there has been a lot of work, led by several groups on distributed Byzantine resilient stochastic gradient descent. But they all have one common flow they assume a trusted node, a single point of failure for the whole training. In this talk, we initiated the study of genuinely distributed Byzantine resilient machine learning, where no node has to be trusted while training. We propose both an asynchronous algorithm and a faster synchronous algorithm. So this talk is about machine learning, but more specifically, the robustness and high availability of distributed machine learning algorithms. Whatever the model used, be it a deep neural network or simple logistic regression, you can see the model as a black box with many parameters. Tweaking these parameters changes the function realized by the model. So in supervised machine learning, which is our focus for this talk, the goal of the training is to find parameters that make the model fit a target function. For non-trivial models like neural network, the learning procedure is iterative. Iteration 1, 2, 3. A few decades ago, the big question was how to change the parameters at each iteration. Stochastic gradient descent, or SGD, is a practical answer to this question. Precisely, the stochastic gradient provides a noisy estimation of the direction that would locally improve the most the answer of the model on the training data. The iterative training algorithm is the following. 1. Estimate the gradient. 2. Turn a bit the parameters following it. 3. Loop back to step 1. As for the parameters, the stochastic gradient is merely a vector of real numbers. So for gradients, we will use this depiction instead. One important point to highlight is that computing these stochastic estimates is by far the most computationally expensive part of the training. So to improve the training speed when even more data is available, it eventually becomes necessary to distribute the gradient estimation on several machines, called worker nodes. The training loop is then slightly modified. First, the parameter server, which holds the parameters of the model, broadcasts it to each worker. Each worker computes each share of the stochastic gradient. The workers send back their estimate to the parameter server, and the server updates the parameters with the average of the received values. This is mathematically equivalent to the non-distributed setting. The Byzantine scenario that the literature considers is when a fraction of the workers are Byzantine. The other workers are called honest, or more simply non-Byzantine. As a side note, it is worth observing that this scenario is also relevant in non-distributed cases, where the workers are actually input data sources, and some of these are controlled by the adversary. If we follow the exact same algorithm, 
the Byzantine workers could, for instance, generate stochastic gradients with arbitrary large coordinates. Then, the average gradient would be able to deviate arbitrary far from the average of the non-Byzantine stochastic gradients. And so with the parameters. In this setting, the adversary controls the function achieved by the model. The literature tackled this issue, for instance, by replacing the average, which is naturally sensible to outliers, by more statistically robust alternatives. These alternatives are called Byzantine Resilient Gradient Aggregation Rules, or, as an acronym, Byzantine Resilient GARs. I leave you to the original papers for more information on each of these functions. Of course, our paper provides a review of this related work and reminds the formal guarantees these functions provide. We choose to use MDA in this work, mainly because its theoretical requirements are relatively easy to satisfy in practice. Now though, one major problem remains. The parameter server has been considered a trusted, single point of failure so far. Our main contribution is then to propose the first algorithms that tackle this last issue to make distributed Byzantine AGD genuinely distributed. As the failure unit is a whole node, we do not have much choice but to duplicate the parameter server. Then, using the consensus toolbox, we could make these servers appear as one to the workers and then reuse pretty much the same algorithm described so far. Workers would select the coordinate-wise median of the parameters to filter Byzantine inputs, and the servers would agree on the set of gradients, one per worker, to aggregate. This assumes signatures, but this is not a problem in practice as our distributed setting here is already permission-based. So we are done, right? Naturally. Using consensus algorithms, when each message can be dozens or hundreds of megabytes large, can be quite ineffective. Moreover, beyond considering multiple Byzantine parameters, we also consider asynchronous networks, which make consensus impossible. Despite this additional obstacle, we show that learning is still possible, and that is the first algorithm I will outline to you. Of course, the full description, along the formal guarantees and proofs, are available in the main paper. The second algorithm, that Arseny Girgis will present to you, improves the training throughput on synchronous networks. We name both of our algorithms BizAGD. The difficulty with asynchrony is that no single honest worker will be able to always deliver the parameters from all the parameter servers. For instance, if we look at worker A, it can first receive the parameters from server 2, then from server 1, and then 3. Now, can worker A wait for the last server, server 4? Of course, server 4 could be Byzantine and, for instance, never respond. So, not to get stuck forever, worker A cannot wait here for more than 3 servers, 3 being the assumed number of available honest parameter servers. The same applies for the other honest workers like worker B, C, D. And vice versa for the honest parameter servers, like server 1, 2, 3. Please also keep in mind that each Byzantine node can send different values to each honest node. In the paper, our theoretical analysis assumes an omniscience adversary. This divergence problem is really key here. To use any of the Byzantine resilient GAR mentioned previously, the honest workers must compute their respective gradients on sufficiently close parameters. This notion of close is formally defined, definition which is directly derived from one common formal requirement of any Byzantine resilient GAR. More specifically and for information, a Byzantine resilient GAR requires that the variance of the honest gradient estimations lies below a constant factor of the gradient norm, and not keeping parameters close eventually breaks this requirement. Our approach is pragmatic. Asynchrony makes it impossible to always keep identical honest parameters. So can we instead bring them closer to each other at each iteration, despite honest nodes only delivering partial different views and Byzantine nodes actively lying? To achieve so, between one or several iterations, we add an additional round amid parameter servers only. 
each broadcasts its current view of the parameters. And the trick we propose to obtain closer parameters after this round is actually very simple and computationally inexpensive. So let me present it using a toy example. It is a toy example as we consider the model as only one parameter to be able to represent it on the line of the real numbers. There are four honest parameter servers, each with the value of its parameter displayed. This is the diameter of the honest parameters. The goal of our simple trick is to make honest parameters closer to each other, despite asynchrony and what the Byzantine server will say. So the additional round we propose is as follows. First, each server broadcasts its parameter. In this toy example, we have that the parameters from server 2 and 3, which are the furthest apart, were delivered by every honest server. Every honest server also systematically delivered the distinct values the Byzantine nodes sent to them, in red in the slide. The parameters from server 1 and 4 were only delivered by respectively workers 3 and 2. With the fraction of honest servers used in this example, no matter what the Byzantine server sends, we observe that the medians of the delivered set of parameters always form a new set with a smaller diameter. Another good point with the median is its linear complexity on the number of values aggregated, with, for instance, the quick select algorithm. I have one final comment for this toy example. One could have noticed that if the honest parameters had been in this very state before the additional round, then after broadcast, each honest server could have delivered extreme values, and the median would not induce any progress. With four honest workers, this situation would occur again and again if, again and again, no honest worker would deliver at least two honest parameters different from their own. You can see this situation as a case of soft partitioning. Honest nodes can still deliver messages from any other node, but only in specific patterns. In the paper, we formally identify a condition that is sufficient not to suffer such kind of partitioning. I now leave the floor to Arsani Girgis, also third year PhD student at EPFL. Now let's consider the synchronous case. We know that solving distributed systems problems usually becomes easier if you assume synchrony. Basically, we have the same model here. The parameter server is distributed on multiple machines. Some of them could be Byzantine or behave arbitrarily. We have also a bunch of workers, and some of them could be also Byzantine. The only difference in this model is that we assume that the links between the nodes are synchronous. This means that there is an upper bound on the time it takes to do some computation and to reply to a request. Of course, it goes without saying that the same algorithm we propose for the synchronous case can work without any changes if you assume synchrony. But now the question is, can we do better if we assume synchrony? And by better, I don't mean in terms of the resilience to the Byzantine behavior, but in terms of the system's performance. The main observation we rely on here is that the communication is a bottleneck. It's known that the distributed ML problem is communication bound. This is confirmed in multiple studies in the literature, which show that most of the time is actually wasted in communication. So the goal of this part of the presentation is to propose a refinement to our algorithm to give the same resilience guarantees, but with less communication overhead and therefore better overall performance. But how can we reduce the communication overhead? Can we reduce the number of communication rounds? The answer is no, because the number of communication rounds is already optimal, as this is the same number of rounds required in the vanilla distributed ML case without any Byzantine resilience. But what we can reduce here is the number of messages per round. To explain how we do this, let me recall the asynchronous algorithm we just presented. In the first round of this algorithm, each worker is required to pull multiple models from multiple parameter servers to compute the gradient width. Yet, in the synchronous case, each worker is required to pull only one model from one parameter server to work with. But then we might have a problem here. What happens if one of the servers is actually Byzantine? For instance, assume that this server here, marked in red, is Byzantine. Then it might send a corrupted model to this worker, and hence the gradient it will compute will be also Byzantine, even if this worker is actually honest. Therefore, we cannot guarantee convergence in this case. 
So now the question is, how can a worker verify the legitimacy of a received model? Ideally, we would like to have some filtering technique like this. Basically, when a worker receives a model, it passes this model through a filter, which can somehow magically tell whether this model is good or not. If it is good, the model passes the filter, and the worker can use this model safely to compute its gradient. Otherwise, the worker would pull another model, probably from another server, hoping to get a correct model this time. For this, we designed two filters that work hand in hand to detect Byzantine models. These two filters are the Lipschitz filter and the Outliers filter. Let me explain to you these two filters in a bit of detail. The first one is called the Lipschitz filter. In a nutshell, this filter tries to control the model growth with respect to its gradient. But what does that even mean? To understand this, let's assume that this is the landscape of the loss function we'd like to minimize. Let's assume that this point here called x represents the current state of the model. If we compute the gradient at this point, the result will be something like this, a gradient pointing towards the local minimum here. If we use this gradient to update the state of the model, we'll get a new model state denoted here by y. Again, if we compute the gradient at y, we'll get something like this. The Lipschitz filter relies on a standard assumption on loss functions used typically in ML applications. This assumption relates the L2 distance between two models to the L2 distance between their gradients. Such a relation is governed by a constant which is called the Lipschitz constant, or the Lipschitz coefficient, which is denoted by L in this equation. A worker uses this assumption to detect a Byzantine model. Basically, when a worker receives a model, it computes an empirical estimation of the Lipschitz coefficient, which is denoted by K here, and compares it with the coefficients of correct models from previous iterations. Intuitively, if this coefficient is close enough to previously computed coefficients of correct models, then this model is probably correct and it passes the filter. The second filter is called the outliers filter. Basically, this filter prohibits big jumps in the model state in two successive steps. For instance, let's assume again that this is a loss function we'd like to minimize. Let's assume that the current state of the model at worker J is theta J L. Assume that this worker then pulls another model from server I, which is called theta I. It's kind of clear to us now that this model looks suspicious, as it's very far from the model owned by the worker in the previous step. Basically, the outliers filter is designed to not accept such a model. More precisely, given our assumptions and the techniques we used in our algorithms, the outliers filter does not accept models that do not satisfy this inequality, which bounds the L2 distance between models in two successive steps. This term on the right hand side is adaptive to the current state of the learning, including the current learning rate and the norm of gradients in previous iterations. Clearly, it also depends on the expected number of Byzantine nodes in the system. I invite you to read the paper for more details about this term here and how we derived it. Now let's move to the last part of our presentation in which we experimentally evaluate our algorithms. Basically, we are interested in two main questions. The first one is, what is the cost of Byzantine resilience? And the second one, is the synchronous version really efficient compared to the synchronous one? To answer these questions, we implemented BSGD with TensorFlow, and we used our implementation to solve an image recognition task using the popular C14 dataset. In the first set of experiments, we deploy BizSGD while using one Byzantine server out of four and five Byzantine workers out of 20. We compare this with vanilla TensorFlow, which is our baseline here. On the y-axis, we measure the accuracy which is a measure of how good the model is in predicting the images labeled. On the x-axis, we put the time it takes to reach this accuracy. The first observation we'd like to make here in this figure is that BizSGD can achieve a high accuracy very close to that of TensorFlow, and therefore, we can see that BizSGD achieves learning conversions. Yet, the notes we could use is this big gap in performance between the two systems. We quantify this overhead by almost 100%. This experiment is done using a batch size of only 100. Yet, interestingly, if we increase the batch size to 2 to 50, we can see that this gap is reduced a lot. And the overhead here in this experiment is only 
The reason for this reduction in the overhead lies in the interplay between the computation overhead and the communication overhead with the batch side. On the one hand, this SGD overhead primarily stems from the communication cost, but such an overhead is not affected by increasing the batch size. On the other hand, increasing the batch size increases the computation time and hence masking a bit the communication overhead of this SGD and therefore reducing the performance gap between the two systems. The second experiment I'd like to show you here is about the efficiency of the synchronous protocol compared to the synchronous one. In this set of experiments, we deploy both variants with multiple models shown here on the x-axis. For each experiment, we measure the throughput of the system, which is basically the number of updates the system can do in one second. The throughput gain on the y-axis denotes the ratio of throughput in the synchronous case to the system's throughput in the synchronous case. We experimented with multiple models, ranging from small models to train the MNIST dataset to large models like ResNet50 and ResNet200. From this figure, we can see that synchronous version always outperforms the asynchronous one, especially with big models. We quantify this performance boost to up to 70%. This brings me to the conclusion of this presentation. In this paper, we proposed an algorithm called BizSGD, which allows for a genuinely distributed Byzantine machine learning. Essentially, BizSGD does not assume any trusted component in the network, as it can tolerate Byzantine servers as well as Byzantine workers. We propose two versions for this algorithm. One of them works in the asynchronous environment, and the other one is much more efficient, yet it requires synchrony. It's important to note that both algorithms do not induce any additional communication rounds on the normal path compared to vanilla distributed learning case with no Byzantine resilience. With this, I'd like to conclude our presentation. Thank you for your attention.